started recording now. Again, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for logging in this afternoon. My name is Amy and I'm the Community Partnerships Manager for Girl Scouts of Colorado and I have the pleasure of bringing everyone together today um, to learn about the women's suffrage movement and the women's suffrage centennial. So as I mentioned, we are recording today's session and as we get started, let's first see um, if we can do a sound check. So if everyone can hear me, can you please just enter a hey or a hello or a yes into the chat box? Okay, I see some yeses and some highs coming in. Great. Um, so as I mentioned, yes, we are recording today's session, but I will let you know that our recording is just of our um, presentation and then our speakers videos. So we are not recording any girls faces or names. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Amy. We have some wonderful presenters with us from the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame and the League of Women Voters of Colorado to learn about this important moment in history and about the last hundred years. But before we really get things kicked off, let's go ahead and get started with the Girl Scout Promise and Law. Please follow along at home. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout law. Of course, the Girl Scout law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, and responsible for what I say and do, and to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and be a sister to everyone. All right, thank you, and well done, everybody. Um, we do have the chat box is available. Um, I'm going to close it right now so that, that anything you put into the chat box will just come to me as the host. Um, a little bit later on and throughout our session today, we will be asking you all questions um, and asking for some, you'll be, you have the opportunity to ask us some questions um, and we will ask you some questions. So when we ask those questions and when it's time for our Q&A, you can either raise your hand um, through the features in Zoom and we can unmute you, or you can use the chat box. So whichever way you're more comfortable um, is the way that you can participate. If you do choose to raise your hand and ask to unmute yourself, please know that you then your face will be in the recording. So if you don't want your face recorded, I definitely recommend just using the chat box to ask your questions. Um, okay, so like I said, we have some fabulous presenters with us today. So I'd really love to welcome Beth Barella, who is the Executive Director of the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. Beth Hendricks, who's the Executive Director of the League of Women Voters of Colorado. And Jill Tejan, who is an inductee of the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame and the Colorado Authors Hall of Fame and a Girl Scout Woman of Distinction. So I'm so happy to kind of turn things over to these women um, in a moment here. I do wanna let you know about some great um, patches that you're working on just by participating today. So from participating today, whether you're with us live or you're watching a recording, you are, oh, actually, so you are working on your Colorado Women's Hall of Fame patch. Um, the one piece is that we're actually not going to go through the scavenger hunt today, so you can do that on your own. I will include a link to the scavenger hunt in a follow-up email, um, but you will be learning about Colorado Women Hall of Fame inductees and you are attending a Colorado Women's Hall of Fame event. And you are also completing the Discover portion of your Girl Scout Suffrage Centennial patch. So you are finding out why it's important to vote. You're gonna learn about some women's first time voting and you're gonna learn why some people maybe were opposed to voting and that will fulfill that section of that patch. Um, there is also a connect section of the patch as well as a take action section of the patch. So again, in my follow-up email that you'll receive this afternoon um, and in the notes, if you're looking at the recording of this session, um, you'll find links to, the, to more information about those patches. And then if you are interested in learning more, you can finish earning your Girl Scout Suffrage Centennial patch. You can go do the Hall of Fame scavenger hunt um, and you can earn your Girl Scout 19th Amendment Ranger Patch, which is through the, call, the National Park Service. And you can also check out all the amazing resources that are on our special Suffrage Centennial blog post. So again, just keep a lookout for an email or look at the notes from the recording and you'll see links to all of these. So now I'm going to turn things over to Beth Barella, who is the Executive Director of the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. Take things away, Beth.
unmute. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Um, let me start this in a slideshow. Um, I want to welcome you all to um, learning just a little bit about Colorado Women's Hall of Fame, but more importantly, learning about the women in Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. <clears throat> 35 years ago, 1985, way before most of you were born, before some of your mothers were born, um, we started a Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. It was started by M.L. Hansen. It's grounded in the historical roots of our inductees, uh, which we'll talk more about, nourished by the leadership of a volunteer board of directors and grows through the strength of all of our supporters, donors, friends, families, past board members, and Girl Scouts. I'm going to ask Jill Tejan to tell you a little bit about how the hall got started. And before I do that, I want to let you know who Jill Tejan is. She's one of our inductees. Yay. So you're actually meeting an inductee today. She is an author, she's a national speaker and electrical engineer. So if any of you wanna go into engineering, um, she, she is a great role model. After more than 40 years in the utility industry, her focus um, changed on or expanded through um, focusing on women's advocacy. She's published 10 books, including her story, A Timeline of the Women Who Changed America, all of you should buy a copy of that, as well as Hollywood, her story, an illustrated history of women and the movies. Jill, will you tell us a little bit about how the Hall of Fame started? Absolutely. And one of the other things I've been instructed to do for this presentation today is to talk about my first time voting. And actually, my first time voting was not voting. When I was 17 years old, the national law changed to allow 18 year olds to vote in the presidential election of 1972. But I was only 17 in November of 1972. So I didn't get to vote in that presidential election, but I have voted in every single election since then. And ML Hansen wanted to be here today, but she couldn't be with us. And so I'm delighted to tell a little bit of that story, which I've heard a couple of different times. And it all started when one of ML's student friends wanted to write a paper for school on a woman who was famous in Colorado and couldn't find one because there, weren't, there wasn't information available about those women. And ML thought that because she knew, as I now know, that women aren't written into the history books, that if a history book has 500 pages, about 50 pages talk about women, and the other 450 pages talk about men. But women constitute 50% of the population, and it's really important that women's stories be told. And so ML founded in 1985 the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame and I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be one of the inductees. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. So I'd love you guys to guess how many women do you think have been inducted into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame in the last 35 years? And you can either raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can use the chat box. Anything that you enter into the chat box now, we'll all be able to see. I bet you have a guess. You think it's a thousand women? You think it's 35 women? Take a guess. I'm not seeing anybody in the chat box yet. Oh, so somebody uh, wrote in, um, they put in 1 million. They 1 million. So make sure everybody to change your chat so that you're putting it to everybody, not just to me. So here are some guesses. 1 million, 35, 5, 10, 300, 135, 100,000, or 135. That's actually a billion. Oh, did I miss? 
No, that's and how that, many zeros there are. There are nine zeros, so that's a billion. A billion. Well, those, those are good guesses, and there's probably a billion women that deserve to be in the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame, but it's a pretty hard thing to do to get into the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. Today, we have 172 inductees, and as you can see, they're in every field. So pick the field you're gonna go into and look at our website and see if you can find a woman that's in that field that can become one of your role models. And the next time that you have to do, um, the next time that you have to do a paper for school on somebody famous, pick a woman and go to our website. You can find a woman to start researching and each of our women have their bios, um, a brief bio on the website. Um, so I just, that's, that's my advertisement for our website. Our website is CO Great Women. And you'll find that when you look up on the Girl Scout website about the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame patch. You can find all kinds of information there. Now, why do we do this? Uh, because again, we're a volunteer board. Um, so we do this in addition to our careers, in addition to raising our families. Um, we believe it's very important to be able to write her story into history. Um, just as Jill, Jill said to you a few minutes ago, about 1%, it sounded like 10%, around 10% of um, history books now have women in them. It was 1% not that long ago. So it's really important for us to let you know there's a lot of women doing a lot of really amazing things. Um, and why is that important? Because we want to inspire you to aspire higher. You too can become a Colorado Women's Hall of Fame inductee someday when you do great things. We, today, we're focusing on um, the 19th Amendment. And that is the amendment that gave women the right to vote in 1920. You live, I believe, I live in an amazing state, Colorado. And we started long before the nation started in giving women the right to vote. As you can see on this map, the very first um, state that gave women the right to vote was Wyoming. But at that time, it wasn't even a state. It was a territory. But they gave women the right to vote in 1869. We gave women the right to vote in 1893. And um, so we were before everybody else. You see the West um, caught on pretty quickly, but it took years. It took 70 years of work for women to get the right to vote. Um, and it was 1920 when um, the nation passed um, the 19th Amendment and uh, states started to ratify that. And it was 1920 by the time enough states had ratified it so that it was now a national vote. Now, what do you think it was like back in around um, 1850 to, to 1920? I've got a few pictures of here that really come from that era, but give me some ideas about what you think it was like to be a woman back then. And remember, chat box is open or you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. But this is a great question. So what do you think life was like for women 100 years ago? And these are actual pictures. These came from that era. Do you think women got to vote? I mean, got to drive back then? Do you think there were cars back then? Um, so somebody answered and they just did it. Uh, it didn't go into the big chat box. A lot of work and it was really hard. A lot of hard work. Um, remember folks, you can enter it so that everyone can see in the chat box. So make sure when he says to um, everyone. Yeah, and, and that is so right. Whoever said that, you are exactly right. It was really hard work. Most of the people lived in, was that you, Kira? 
Um, most of the women lived, <laughs> good for you, most of the women lived in um, rural settings. So there weren't large cities, there, there um, were some cities, but they lived in the country, they worked on farms, they worked on ranches, they were out there milking the cows, they were working all day long while they're raising their kids. Um, do you see how the mother is, is bathing the baby? Why do you think she's bathing the baby that way? Any ideas? No bathtub. No bathtub, no running water. Right, is what the answer was in the chat room. Oh, good. No, no indoor, indoor plumbing. plumbing. Yeah. Yep, no indoor plumbing. I don't know if any of you have gone up to camping or a cabin where you didn't have indoor plumbing, but it wasn't that all, all that much fun. It certainly wasn't my favorite part of camping. And that's how everybody lived. And no, so, no electricity, no hot water. And, and these women also, Beth, they didn't have the right to go to school. They yeah. didn't have the right to vote. If they owned a piece of property with their husband or family member, when that family member died, the woman could not inherit the property. Women had no property rights. If a woman got divorced from her husband, she could not have custody of her children. And, and things were, were really very, very difficult for everyone, but particularly for women in this period of time. I think, Jill, you've told me before they were considered property. That's correct. Of Women, their husband. Correct. And so if they wanted to leave their husband, they could be punished through the law correct. For, for choosing to leave. So it was a very different time. I'm really glad I live now. So we're going to now talk. Um, I'm, I'm passing this to Beth Hendricks. And Beth is now going to talk about um, the, the League of Women Voters and the right to vote. So let me stop sharing. You're on mute, Beth. Okay, is that better? That's great. Great, sorry about that. Thank you all for being here to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the right to vote of American citizen women. My name is Beth as well, and I'm with the League of Women Voters of Colorado, where we continue to fight for the rights of all people for safe, fair, and accessible voting. Now, suffrage sounds like a negative word. It sounds like suffer or suffering, but it means the right to vote. So the battle for this right to vote for women was fought by many people, men and women, who were referred to as suffragists. The suffragists were a group of people of all colors and backgrounds who worked to make our society more fair. So Beth, the college, you need to do a, uh, to put it in presentation mode. Thank you. I think it is. Um, but just go, to, yeah, from the beginning. There you go. Okay. Sorry, but I can't see my notes then. Sorry, but I'm going to go this way because I don't know yeah. how else. Do pre present online. I'm sorry, I thought that would work. There's another way to do it, but that's not it. 
Um, maybe, maybe uncheck presenter view. Okay. Is that any better? Well, and then try from, from where it says from beginning. Nope. Um, Sorry, all. I'm just going to go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the colors that you see here on this slide represent the colors of the suffrage movement. Purple symbolize loyalty. White is the emblem of purity. And gold is the color of light and life and symbolizes a torch that guides our purpose. So we hear a lot about civil rights and um, what does that term mean to you all? Can you use the chat box to tell me what that term means to you? Yes, yeah, so everyone, the question is, what does civil rights mean to you? Or what, does, what do you think civil rights means? And you can enter your answers into the chat box or raise your hand and we can unmute you. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a stab at an answer that uh, civil rights to me means rights that everybody has. And if somebody asked um, gender equality or having the right to everything women can do now, no slavery, the right to free speech. Mm -hmm. Now the definition of civil rights is the rights of citizens to freedom and equality. So, and when I hear the term civil rights, I usually think of Martin Luther King Jr. And he fought for the equality of black people. So, but getting women the right to vote was one of the largest civil rights movements in the history of the world because it affected 20 million people. And August 26th, which is only 12 days from now, March marks 100th anniversary of women in the United States getting the right to vote. And change in our country doesn't happen overnight. It takes a lot of courage and persistence. And this is true whether we're talking about women voting or Martin Luther King Jr. or some of the other changes that are, people are fighting for today through the Black Lives Matter movement. So the battle for women's suffrage took 80 years. And many of those leading the fight early on didn't live to see the right to vote, but it was a cause worth fighting for, no matter how long it took, and eventually they were successful. So in 1840 was when the fight was first begun, way before your parents or your grandparents or even your great grandparents were born. So how would you have liked to have worn dresses like these all the time, every day. I think it would have been really, really hot. And this fight went on until 1920. So this photo is from around 1918, and it shows women who were college students picketing in front of the White House. The suffragists were the first people to ever picket in front of the White House. And a lot of people didn't like it. They thought the suffragists were being disrespectful to the president by doing this. And throughout their fight, the suffragists were spit on and called bad names, and they were arrested and imprisoned, and they were generally treated very badly because people thought they weren't being ladylike by picketing and fighting for the right to vote. So suffragists were women and men and girls of all ages, races, religions, and beliefs. So lots of posters and drawings were printed to try to convince people that women should be able to vote. This is from the probably 1915 
And it looks to me like she's wearing pants, but women weren't allowed to wear pants back then. They weren't even allowed to wear pants. So on August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment was ratified, which means it was enacted, and women won full voting rights. So to understand how hard the fight for women's suffrage was, it's important to understand the process for amending the US Constitution. It's something that's been done only 27 times in the history of our country, which is 244 years old. First, a proposed amendment must be approved, approved by a two thirds vote in both houses of Congress. So both the House of Representatives and the Senate by more than half, by two thirds. And then the amendment must be adopted by three quarters of our states, or 36 states in 1920. And these were all men who were voting. So the suffragists had to convince all of the men who were our elected officials that they should be allowed to vote. So why do you think it took so long for that amendment to pass? Now, 36 states had to agree to allow women to vote for the 19th Amendment to be enacted. And by July 1920, 35 states had, had voted to approve the amendment. And it was down to Tennessee's turn to vote. Here's Tennessee in the United States. And it was very close. It was down to one vote. And this man, Henry Byrne was a very young legislator. He was only 24 years old. And he told all of his friends that he was going to vote against the amendment, which meant that it would fail in Tennessee. But the morning of that vote, he got a letter from his mom. And it said, hurrah, and vote for suffrage. Don't keep them in doubt. Be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat. Mrs. Catt was leading the suffrage movement in 1920. So Representative Byrne surprised everyone by voting for suffrage and the amendment passed in Tennessee, giving us the three quarters of states agreement needed for the amendment to be ratified and put into law. Now the 19th amendment is really very simple. It just says the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. It's very short and simple. Now, the League of Women Voters, where I work, was founded 100 years ago by the suffragists, in fact, by Mrs. Catt. Six months before the 19th Amendment was ratified, a group of suffragists were very hopeful that they would be successful in their quest to vote. And so they formed the League of Women Voters to educate these 20 million new voters to help women carry out their new responsibilities as voters. Have you ever tried to do something new and you didn't know how to do it so it was kind of hard? The League was formed to teach people how to vote, to make the process of voting easy. And that's what we still do today. We give people the tools they need to register to vote, and we help voters learn about the issues on each ballot so people can make up their own minds how they want to vote. The League does not tell people how to vote and it doesn't support the Democrats or the Republicans or any other political party. We just want everybody to vote however they want to vote. It's the voting that's important. So today we can be thankful for the bravery and the hard work of so many Americans who fought so hard to secure the right of women to vote. 
And it's important that we appreciate the difficulty of this fight as we build upon the progress that they achieved. And a lot of work remains to be done as we work today towards a more equal society for women, for communities of color, for immigrants, and for many others. So voting is using your voice in how our country is run and who runs it. And I hope that you'll see that 100 years ago, women weren't allowed to use their voice. So I hope that each one of you will respect these fighting suffragists and vote every chance you get when you're old enough that you stand on the shoulders of the women who came before you so that you can reach higher than they did. Your voice is important and your vote is your voice. So be sure to use it. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. That was super. I think we're going to have Beth Barella come back on um, and talk to us a little bit about um, some trivia and questions from the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame scavenger hunt. I will be glad to do that. Um, it doesn't look like I can share. Let me see. Um, It's giving me the sharing, sharing option now. So let me go back and share again. Um, I'm gonna go to our next slide, I think. Come on. Um, are you seeing the slide of women? There we go. Um, I'm gonna to go to the next slide where we're gonna talk about suffragists. Just like Beth Hendricks said, suffragists were women who um, really worked hard to get us the right to vote. And they were not always treated really nicely. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you about three or four of them. And then there's lots more information on our website. You can actually go to the website and you can take the suffra suffragists scavenger hunt and you can find 15 women that made quite a bit of difference both in Colorado and nationally to accomplish this so oh my I didn't realize I had set it up this way so um, Elizabeth Robbins Stone she was born in 1801 she died in 1895 we inducted her into our Hall of Fame in 1980. 88. This is a direct quote from Elizabeth. I've waited a lifetime for this privilege. Elizabeth Robin, Robbins Stone, upon casting her first vote in 1894 in Colorado, the first election after Colorado won the full suffrage rights. She was 93 years old and she died when she was 94. So she lived her whole life and did get the right to vote right before she died. Um, so that was momentous in her life. I don't know if any of you heard of Julia Anna Archibald Holmes. Um, she was a, a rather rambunctious, rather adventurous um, young lady in the time. Um, I, somebody that I think I would have really liked getting to know. She was born in 1838 and she died in 1887. She was inducted into our hall in 2014. And this is a quote from her. I'd love you guys to say in chat whether or not you've ever been told this before. But she said, nearly everyone tried to discourage me from attempting it but I believed that I should succeed and now here I am and I feel like I would not have missed this glorious sight for anything at all. And that's because she was the first woman ever to um, climb Pikes Peak. And um, she climbed it in the garb of the day, the dressing of the day. It was called bloomers. So she was called the Bloomer Girl on Pikes Peak. 
how many of you would have liked to wear outfits like this and be called the bloomer girl ivana would you like to wear an outfit like this you liked the dresses but would you like the bloomers too um, and so that was Julia Anna Archibald Holmes. She also worked very hard in the 1960s and 70s. She became the, um, the secretary of the National Woman Suffrage Association, helped to set up state associations, and attempted to vote in 1871 and was denied the right to vote. How many of you would like to climb Pikes Peak? It's pretty incredible. And in um, 2008, at the 150th anniversary of uh, Julia climbing Pikes Peak, three girls dressed up just like they did back in the day, and they climbed Pikes Peak. How many of you would have done that? And that's the beautiful sight they got to see. So we live in a pretty amazing state. Here's another, another amazing woman. And her name is Elizabeth Piper Ensley. She was born in 1847, died in 1919. So she didn't really even get to see the national right to vote. Although she got to vote in Colorado in 1893. Um, she, was in, she was inducted into our Hall of Fame this year. She was born in the Caribbean. She was a black suffragist instrumental in getting vote for women in Colorado, as well as at the national level. She had three children. She founded the association of, um, I got to move my pictures, Colored Women's Clubs. She advocated for the poor and the homeless and was an absolutely amazing woman. Now I'm going to play a little video about one of our um, suffragists in the hall named Ellis Meredith. And this is a video that we show at our inductees to introduce each of our um, inductees. Can you hear it? Ellis Meredith worked for women's suffrage for many, many years for the vote in Colorado and then at the national level once Colorado obtained the vote. She was a journalist. She wrote three novels. And during her life, she wrote for many newspapers, many national magazines. She went to the Women's Congress of Chicago in 1893 purposefully just to meet the women national leaders, such as Susan B. Anthony, Carrie Chapman Catt, Lucy Stone, and connected with them and did correspondence with them over the years. And so as the leader of, or is seen as one of the leaders of the movement in Colorado, that tag of her just being called the Susan B. Anthony of Colorado just seemed to become commonplace. If you put the work that she did in context of the period, I'm sure it had to be very difficult women were expected to stay at home and take care of their husbands. It was well thought that women were too frail to do the kind of work that she did during this time. That speaking in front of groups was a man's place. That being a leader and traveling in for her, for the cause that was things men did women didn't do she was the first woman to hold an elected office in in denver she was elected to the um, election commission in 1910 and served until 1914. Um, she ran against seven men and got more votes than all seven of them combined um, and so in 1910, women didn't even have national suffrage. And so, but in Colorado, they did. 
And so she was the first woman to hold an elected office in Denver. The last many years of her life, she moved to Washington, D.C. in 1917 to work for the Democratic National Headquarters. And she lived there until her death in 1955 at the age of 90. She was a frail woman. She was under five feet tall, was less than 100 pounds. And, but she was a force to be dealt with, even um, with her size. I think Ellis would want women and young girls today to step out of their comfort zone, to be, to take risks, to work for what they believe is right, um, and to work together with men and women to achieve what they think is the right thing or, or issue that they're passionate about. Um, the woman talking in that video is Leslie Karnaskas. Leslie is the person who nominated um, Ellis Meredith to be uh, selected or to be inducted in the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. Last year, we got over 100 nominations for women to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, and we only choose 10. So you can imagine how many amazing women there are out there, and we can't even honor all of them. Leslie is a historian, and we are very grateful for all that she brings to us at the Hall. Now, before I talk a little bit about this and the next step, I just want to mention that we have another person on the call. Her name is Barb Beckner, and Barb is the board chair for the Colorado Women's Hall of Fame. Um, this is a volunteer position. Barb volunteers her time, and through her work and the entire board, we're able to bring you stories like this. I'm not sure if Barb can just be unmuted for a minute and say hi. And if not, we'll go on. Uh, hi, thank you, Amy, for <laughs> unmuting me. So welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to be a part of this. And this sounds, sorry, I was late. It sounds like Beth and Jill and Beth and Amy are doing an amazing job. Uh, I, um, I actually was a Brownie and a Girl Scout. So I grew up, my mother was my troop leader. So I'm very happy to, to be a part of this in a small way. So I hope you guys are enjoying it. Thank you. Thank you, Barb. Um, the amendment that was adopted and took 70 years of women working really hard to get adopted was very, very simple. It simply said, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this, this article by appropriate legislation. It was simple. It was simple and straightforward. And if you find out about any of the amendments or any of the bills that get passed anymore, they are not simple and they are not always straightforward. This was simple, straightforward. Now, there's more to that story though. There's always more to the story. Um, women were still working on, on getting the right to vote even after 1920 when the 19th Amendment was ratified. Um, at that time, Native American tribes had to create a treaty with the, the um, President and Congress of the United States in order for them to have rights, and that included the right to vote. So some Native American women could not vote until 1924. Um, immigrants of Asian descent were not given the right to become U.S. citizens until 1952. And so they didn't have access to voting, women or men. And many of the states, especially the states in the southern area, although at a national level, we had the right to vote. They made it extremely difficult for um, black uh, people to vote, black men, black women to vote. And until um, 1964, when the Civil Rights Act went in, um, was that rectified. And there still are difficulties, but 
there is another act, the Civil Rights Act, that requires all people to be given the right to vote. And in 1975, Congress extended the Voting Rights Act, so they expanded it to also include the protection for language minority citizens. That means they interpret the uh, voting uh, documents into Spanish. So Spanish people, Spanish speaking people can now um, vote much more easily than they could before then. And that um, act also uh, helped the disabled have um, an easier way to vote. So things are, are really great things take a long time to happen. Um, I also want to acknowledge this beautiful poster that I have here is um, the work of a woman named Ad Adri Norris. And she's a beautiful artist that is creating many, many um, beautiful uh, designs about women and what women have done. So I'd love it if you went to her website and looked at her website, you would learn a lot and you could support an artist. So we are eternally grateful in Colorado Women's Hall of Fame for the women that went before us and fought for our rights. Um, I thank you very much for this opportunity and don't forget to order your um, patch. It's a pretty great patch to have on your, a uh, fun patch to have on your sash. Wonderful. Well, thank you to all of our presenters. Um, that was wonderful. I know I definitely learned a lot. Um, and then now we have the rest of our time today is for us to take questions. Um, so all of our experts are available here to answer your questions. Um, I, as we, so please feel free to enter your questions again into the chat box. Um, everything that you enter there, or if you select the right um, option, you, we can all see it. Um, and I'll read questions out loud. So I did see somebody entered a question earlier and I promised I would read it out loud. So the question was, are there any states that haven't ratified the 19th Amendment? <laughs> May I answer? Please go ahead, anybody. Uh, no, there are not. Although there are states, uh, well, in 1920, because 36 states ratified, the 19th Amendment became the law of the land, but it took until 1984, 64 years later, for every single state to ratify the amendment. And Mississippi was the last one. I just found that out today and I was amazed. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, somebody else asked, why were some women opposed to women getting the right to vote? <laughs> That's a toughie. It's something I don't understand. But there are still some women today who think that women shouldn't be able to vote. But I think they thought it wasn't ladylike or that women were too emotional to vote or didn't have enough education. Jill, what do you think? Well, it, it reminds me of the issue about whether or not women had the right to an education or could be educated. And it was thought for many years I mean, like hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, that if women actually became educated, that would somehow make them not capable of having children. And since it was viewed that their primary function in life was to have children, that therefore they could not be educated, just like there was a belief for a very long time that if women played sports, that they would damage their ability to have children, which was the paramount reason. And so um, it's, it goes back to also the fact that the Equal Rights Amendment has never passed. And the Equal Rights Amendment has had many women who are opposed to the language of women getting equal rights. 
I, and, and you look at the results today and you see that, I don't remember exactly what the right number is, but let's just say that women earn about 75 or 77% of what men earn in for comparable jobs. I mean, why wouldn't women want to get paid the same amount that men get paid for, for jobs? And so I think there's a lot of misinformation that gets spread, a lot of fear that happens. But what I personally believe is that when women have rights and when women are valued, that makes society better for everyone. And one of the things I didn't say earlier that I probably should have said is I'm a lifetime Girl Scout and that I was chair of the board of Girl Scouts here in Denver for a long time. And that I was, uh, there weren't daisies when I was little. So I was a brownie and a Girl Scout and then a cadet. And so I'm a very, very strong supporter of Girl Scouts. And I believe that Juliet Gordon Lowe knew that women were going to get the right to vote when she established Girl Scouts in 1912. And remember, she was in Savannah, Georgia, which didn't get, women didn't get the right to vote until August 26, 1920, Equality Day. But she knew that women would get the right to vote. And the reason she established Girl Scouts was so that women would have the, the courage, confidence, and character to be good citizens. There was another question I saw that came up that said, why did people think that women couldn't do anything? And I love it that you all wonder why that would be so. Because, you know, we know better than that, don't we? That women can do anything. And actually, they can do something a man can't do. They can have a baby. So um, we are very, very capable but it has taken a long time for people to realize that. In the 1600s, women that learned how to read were sometimes burned as witches. So it's just been a long history of women being able to, to demonstrate they are capable, as capable, not more, as capable as men. And I'm really glad you all live in the age where that is understood by most people. And you're proving it every day, so just keep it up. I would also add that until fairly recently, <clears throat> there weren't schools where girls could go to learn. And it really wasn't very common for almost anyone to have graduated from what we would consider high school today. And it was even rarer for anyone to have gone to college. So the level of education that you get today and the opportunities that you get today really provide you with significant value and allow you to be really of great service, like Girl Scout says, to help make the world a better place. And there's still lots of countries in the world that don't allow women to vote, don't even allow women to drive cars don't allow women to go to school. So we've come a long way in the United States. We still have a lot to do, but we've come a long way. Um, so while we see if there's some more questions that come in, I know Jill shared with us um, her story of her first memory of voting. And I wonder if Beth and Beth, both Beths could share their memories too, and I can share mine. You want? You go first, Beth. Head well, <laughs> I first voted um, when I first went to college, and it was a little bit confusing to me because I was away from home for living away from home for really the first time, and I had to apply for an absentee ballot, which is kind of like what Colorado does now, which is vote by mail. Um, but it was confusing, but it was really important to me. And that's when I first learned about the League of Women Voters and how they teach people about the issues that are on each ballot and give you the pros and cons 
of each issue. And I found um, a pamphlet that the League of Women Voters had put out, and it really helped me to vote the very first time I voted. So I'm very proud to be working here now. That is a great story. Um, I could first vote in 1962, and that wasn't for a presidential election. It was um, for the governor, but I voted for John Love, and he became the governor. Um, and ever since then, I've, like um, I think Jill Tijan said, I've voted every election because I think it's a privilege and a right, and um, it's a way we can be heard. Um, and my first memory, so I also, when I was first eligible to vote, I was off at college living far away from home in another state. So I voted with an absentee ballot. But the first time that I went to my polling location and went into the little booth where you placed your vote, I know we, were, we have mail-in ballots here, but I was in New Jersey. I didn't know how to work the machine. And I had to ask somebody to come in and show me how to use it. And um, I used to work with Girl Scouts who are working on their gold award. And I remember one girl um, put together a project where she worked with her county clerk's office and she brought in, um, the county clerk helped her run the student body election, just like an election out in the community. So everybody got to experience what it was like to use a voting machine. Um, and I remember, I will always remember that and thought that was such a great idea. So hopefully um, everyone can have the experience to do something like that someday. But it was interesting to me because I had to ask for some help that first time. Oh, and I love, so somebody asked, what is your favorite Girl Scout cookie? I love always finding out from our experts what their favorite Girl Scout cookies are. So Beth Hendricks said Thin Mints, but Samoas are great too. Jill says Thin Mints and Tagalongs. What about that? you, Beth, Varela? I said Samoas. Oh, <laughs> oh, but I said it privately. I didn't mean to, oh. but, um, and my husband loves, loves, <laughs> Um, what are the shortbread cookies? Um, Trefoil. Trefoils. And mm -hmm. my daughter was able to secure a carton of trefoils for him last week. And it was like his happiest moment. <laughs> um, so, um, guys do a wonderful job out there. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions left for our experts? Who's going to climb Pike's Peak this weekend? Ella has a question. Maybe you could you read it out loud? Because I'm not sure I see it on my end. I just saw her raise her hand. Oh. I don't see it on my end, but if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand again and I'll keep an eye out or enter it into the chat box. Ella, were you raising your hand because you were gonna climb Pikes Peak this weekend? Oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I wanna say thank you to Beth Hendricks and Beth Varela and Jill Tijan. You are wonderful resources for Girl Scouts. Um, so I thank you so much for your time today uh, talking to all of us about the Women's Suffrage Centennial. Thank you to all the amazing Girl Scouts who are out there listening, um, whether you're listening live or listening to a recording. I hope you learned as much as I did. Please continue learning. Um, check out our notes or a follow-up email for some more resources and links. And don't forget to go out and get your Colorado Women's Hall of Fame patch. So well done everybody. And thank you again so much for joining us. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you all. Bye. Bye.